talks in english so uh, before we start just checking if you are listening to me okay and if you are seeing me okay too so the guys that are with us can you please just say in, uh, send a message and check if everything is fine okay we had some issues and i said that this was because we had a database now but uh, our dba already didn't start up so we are uh back okay and uh, the golden talks of today we are gonna talk with a, a traveler dba can you imagine that and uh, one cool thing that i can start to talk about here is that he <laughs> knows to say some uh some i would say many words in a lot of different languages so if you are ready to this just watch and check it out okay so ladies and gentlemen we have here on golden talks today pete the visor hello pete how are you <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy, do you want me to say stuff in different languages all of a sudden? <laughs> okay. I, I, I uh, vaguely remember obrigado. <laughs> that's cool. What another word in Portuguese do you remember? Just say to us. Parabéns. Oh, I remember cool. a lot of Portuguese say parabéns. And cool. I, you should have prepared me for this question. At one point in time, I was able to take an order on the phone in Portuguese, more or less. Oh. And that, that, was one, that was one of my most laughing items I've done when I was in Curitiba. <laughs> in, uh... Cool. Yeah, we are having like, some... Uh, order, like, uh, ah! <laughs> ah. <laughs> That's cool. So, sometimes the connection, the connection is breaking, but I think I got what you said. And one very cool thing that you mentioned is that you already uh, came to Brazil, right? Yes, uh, 98, in the years 98, 99, 2000 and 2001, I visited uh, oh Brazil God. a number of times. Um, I spent a lot of time in, um, in Curitiba, sort of south of Sao Paulo. You, the, the Brazilians will know what Curitiba is. The rest of the world, Google it. Yeah, that's that's cool. If you don't know Curitiba, <laughs> Google it. Yeah, it's a very yes. beautiful city. Yeah, correct. So, and and be careful. There is a crocodile in the lake. Never mind. <laughs> oh really? It's a a crocodile joke. in the lake. Oh my god. <laughs> cool. And, and, and uh, I used to say and, that. Yeah. Sure. And as we are talking about Brazil, uh, what what else? Uh, what else things can you tell us uh, about what was your how was your experience in Brazil? What fine things? What you liked most and things like that? Oh, you sh um, it was a very uh, friendly environment. Of all the user groups, we had to train and, and educate. The Brazilians, of course, resisted our system, but they did that in a very polite way. And in the end, they they at least pretended to to do what we want we wanted them to do um, and uh, the running joke was that that's pete and his lunch is a milio cosido because the brazilians used to go out for a large big meal and they took me and the colleagues out to all sorts of uh, caruscarias 
the, uh, the meat eating places. And I said, no, I'll just have one of those cooked corn cobs, a milio cruzido with butter and salt. Delicious. I remember that. Yeah. Um, That's good and I, they, they also taught me what a caipirinha was, of course. Yeah, caipirinha is the one that no one ever forget. Yeah, believe me. <laughs> and the place yeah. you are say probably it's as we say here in Brazil, it's churrascaria. It's like a barbecue place. Yes, churrascaria. Yeah. Say that. Yeah, I, I, yes. say that again. Churrascaria, the place churrascaria. where you go to eat yes. meat like Thanks. a barbecue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. good memories. Yeah. Very cool. And uh, now, as you're talking about countries, you are on German? What place I are am you? Currently, right I'm in Switzerland. Switzerland, yeah, I'm that's in... right. Switzerland. Yeah. Right. And uh, I am, uh, you need to give an honorable mention to a guy called Julian Frey from the Swiss user community, because I'm in his house using his internet. Okay, so it's Julian, right? So Julian, if you're Correct, Julian. Uh, listening to us, or if you are near to Pete, just came to the camera and say hello to us. Is it fine? <laughs> you can see you, and you yes. also can participate with us. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think he's uh, he's glued to his laptop. He's probably playing Pokemon or something. But now, kidding. <laughs> no, he's here, right. and I, I'm fairly sure he's listening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I needed a reliable internet place, and I this is one of the there he is. Um, and I, I remember this house with really good Wi-Fi, internet, and a beautiful view, and good food. So here I am. You are in the best place, right? I think so. Cool. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I have one uh, hello from a guy called Frank Pacho. He said, hey, I will not be able because I will do yeah. uh, presentation, but please say an hello and from Frank to Pete. Okay. Say hello back. I know he's doing the, the Geneva DevOps uh, meetup yeah, at the moment. That's right. Sure. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Right. And uh, so you already came to Brazil. You are now in Switzerland. You was born in Netherlands. And uh, how yeah. many countries do you already travel, Pete? Tell to us. Oh, I, I don't have the number here but uh, between 30 and 40, something like that. 40. In, uh, in my wild years, I, I traveled a lot by airplane. And that's really mm -hmm. exciting when you're a young consultant having to go everywhere, uh, change, mm -hmm. change the currency, learn to say thank you, that sort of thing. And, and uh, at a certain point in time, I just, I just ride around Europe. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more relaxing this way. I don't have to stand in line in the airports anymore. I stand in line in traffic now. All right. This is very nice. So you are really a, a traveler DBA or DBA traveler. Not sure how it's the right way to say. I, uh, bo both are correct, in my opinion. And it's, uh, it is a way to combine uh, the hobby and, and the, one, the one hobby and the other hobby, if you like. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. That's yeah. cool. And uh, uh, we are talking about the, the Travel GBA life, but uh, before everything, before that, uh, tell us how was the starting of uh, your interest in for computers, how uh, everything started for you when you were, for instance, young, when you started to yeah. do your first contacts with mm -hmm. computer. So how was, how everything started to you in this computer world? Tell a little bit to us. Oh, I was a student and I was really enthusiastic. Uh, I studied agricultural engineering, anything to do with growing plants, uh, agricultural machines. I loved to drive tractors when I was a boy. So I, I guess I studied, that's why I studied agricultural engineering. We thought in the, in the 80s, computers had great potential. So I, I ended up doing something like computer science and information technology. And I did my share, fair, fair share of programming in C and Fortran and Pascal and a few other languages. And I learned about databases. And, and I, was, I, I think I was really lucky that my 
my IT course, my information, my computer science course contained a lot of database stuff. And that, that sort of laid the foundation for it. I, until in my first years, I was an enthusiastic programmer. I loved to do programs, algorithms, make a computer do things. But at some point I discovered, hmm, maybe the data is more important than the program. And that's how I got a DBA. I, I programmed video camera stuff with, with very few, with, with very little computing power. We tried to read images and there was a whole raft of technology behind that suddenly that was interesting to discover. Um, we used controllers to control things like climate and control machines. We wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't call it robotics now, but we tried to control machines. Um, all of that set me up in information technology. And then there was a huge tech component. Well, we didn't have a lot of users. We had programs to fight with. All right, that's that's very cool. So uh, you start in the programming world with a computer without so much power, and then you are, yeah. you realize it, that the data is more important than the programs. That's that's cool. That's what we yes. are living nowadays through. <laughs> Yet, I would say. Correct. I I had a lot of arguments with the the, the DBAs, the data, well, the system admins and the DBAs. And in my base courses, I had learned about date and cot and, and normalization and database design. And, and that sort of came together. I was also lucky. I had a manager who could explain things. I had a good boss. And he also directed me towards data rather than programs. And at, at some point, I said to my manager, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll play the DBA role but I want a contract. I want you to write down, I'm allowed to walk out on this role in 12 months time. And I want a course and a training and a blah and, and etc. So I got the training, I became the DBA and it, it took about uh, three months, six months to discover, wow, this is an interesting role. <laughs> but not, not in the least, in the mid nineties, uh, the DBA had the power to shut down the database <laughs> and everybody called us the DBA mafia, but you got DBA to mafia. listen and yeah, the DBA mafia, we were in charge of the data. Nobody could pass the DBA. We were, oh, you want something? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but I learned a lot. I learned a lot. Uh, I, I learned to listen. I learned to, 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 to interact with users and business and projects and what have you. I learned how, how evil managers can be and how good a good manager can be. And uh, I think I owe that to the database, the, the power of data, so to speak. And then I suddenly was a DB. I, be, I became Mr. DB. I think there's a lot of base persons uh, from, uh, who, who became DBAs in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s. That was a good mm -hmm. career path at the time, and I was lucky to be in the right seat at the right time, so to speak. Right. Does that, does that give you a good answer? I, I was a complete nerd when I was a student, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I can see, and uh, you're going to show more stories that I can prove that to us. Uh, I, I'm seeing here two guys, two Oracle Ace saying hello to you, Pete. We have here Alex Zabala saying hello from USA. Yeah, right and the uh, other one, it's Frank. Frankie say hi, Pete. Long time, no, no see. That's Is that cool. Frankie Frank from, from Brazil. Brazil? Yes, that's right. Hey, say hello. <laughs> uh, we'll, meet, we'll meet next year at some conference, I'm sure. Yes, yes. Hope I can see you too personally in the next year, right? If the uh, presidential conference go back. Okay, okay. So this is uh, the beginning of your career as a DBA, and uh, you realize, as we say here in Brazil, that uh, the DBA sometimes is called the. Uh, in English, it, it would be something like God DA, you know, yeah. <laughs> or something. Yeah, the, the God of the data. God. <laughs> the God of the data, yes. Yes. And what can I say? It, it, was, it was a fun seat to have at the time. 
And, and at some point you need to discover that with the godlike power comes the responsibility to use it properly. Don't, don't do too many stupid things and don't abuse. You know? <laughs> but yeah, there is, there is one other thing that you need to think. Um, I, at some point, I was at a few points in my IT career, I was lucky to have the right boss. Um, that if, if you can't find or if you don't have a boss that you can trust, you, you, you need to move on. As a DBA, you make mistakes. Of course, I did the classic thing of overwriting um, the, the, the production DBA. Somebody asks for a new, fresh test copy. We had a procedure for that. It was an easy script. You start up the script to refresh the test environment. One day, I accidentally refreshed production. Ouch. At that point, you need your boss to cover you. And uh, one of my bosses said, uh, he said, oh, yeah, well, I'm glad you told us. We might not even have noticed. And we recovered it in somewhere inside two hours. And then he said something like, you realize we will now chain you to the table because you've just proven you can actually recover this system if it breaks. You know, that's valuable to us. You know, you're going to be sitting there for a while. I said, hmm, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, sometimes this happens, right? But uh, uh, the most important thing is the experience that we, you got when these things happen, and uh, you are a human being, right? So we are not uh, uh, excluded from errors, right? Sometimes it's happened, right? It, it, it happens. You can try to automate it out. You, you, you can... If you automate the human out of it, like the DevOps culture currently tries to, you can probably prevent that sort of error. But also, the more you automate, the more you, the, the more you try to prevent it. If something goes wrong, you're probably in really deep trouble. There is a, if you allow me this, that I, if you build levees or dams or dikes to protect your land, you know, we do that in, in the Netherlands. We build dams. Um, you can build a really high dam and you're very, very secure and safe behind it. But at some point, once in a thousand years, if that thing breaks, you are in really deep shit. But if, if you have the habit of having your land overflow every three years or so, you're at least able to, able to fix it. You can live with that. So there is a, there is a price to pay for that sort of security. Yeah. This is where the DevOps guys come in and say, oh, Chaos Monkey, Chaos Zoo. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And with some uh, automation, of course, this can uh, solve a lot of uh, issues and problems, right? I agree with you. Yeah. And uh, talking about your starting with databases, uh, you started already with Oracle database or you also had... Uh, uh, opportunity and uh, started work with the other database and then you join Oracle World. Yep. Yes, before Oracle, I've worked with things like DBase and Clipper as well. Yeah. Right. Is that relevant? Yeah. Okay. So you start with Clipper and then you, you, you went to the Oracle database world, right? Uh, yes. It, it may be worth saying that I, I told my boss once, this Oracle thing, nah, it's too big, too expensive, too complicated. You know, the market will kill it. And, and look what happened to Oracle. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's, that's right. Uh, and uh, talking about automation thing, uh, Frankie did a comment he, uh, here in the chat saying automation to rule them all. Yes, automation can rule yeah. everything and avoid a lot of uh, human mistakes, right? Yeah. Cool. And uh, I have a question here from Paulo in the chat. He's saying, hi, Pete. What about the technological scene in your country? Uh, does the public administration use modern technology solutions? Are there many possibilities for partnerships between public and private? Well, yeah, that's a fairly deep question. Um, 
if, if the audio still works, the Netherlands has a lot of IT in, in tax collection and administration, if you like. We currently have a few scandals where both the, the process and the IT itself um, made mistakes and, 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 and caused a lot of trouble for people. So there are questions in parliaments, ministers falling over for that. Um, and it, it is a typical case of too complicated process and then an automated system and an automated procedure leading to big mistakes. So I'm a bit careful to, to trust my um, public administration with a lot of IT. There has to be some sort of human check, human constraint, human control, if you like. Mm -hmm. Cool. Does that make sense? We have people in deep trouble because of automated processes, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So automation is good, but uh, we've made we still make mistakes, and we'll probably make mistakes until the end of time. You know, to 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 make mistakes is human. To to really fuck things up, you need a computer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And and uh, after uh, that, uh, uh, in your career, you started okay. to uh, going very deep in Oracle technology and. Uh, what uh, technology did you specialize in? What do you consider that you worked a lot and you know a lot yeah. uh, in our Oracle world? Tell a little bit about this trust. Yeah, that's a good point. What do I really know? I'm not, I don't know Golden Gate very deeply. <laughs> I've only used that in two projects and it worked and I was happy with it. Um, I would consider I know the database. I know how to design a data model. I know how to uh, to criticize, how to design an application to access data. That, that's one thing I, I know and I'm comfortable with, and I can recover a database if that's necessary. Um, I'm, I have, I've been asked to specialize by my manager in uh, somewhere around 2005 or so. You need a specialization. And my answer was, no, I don't. I want to be a, a partner. I want to be able to talk to a number of people in, in application and database area. And I want to be able to help them at a practical level. And if I become a super specialist in the cost-based optimizer or in uh, index block dumps, or in um, data guard replication, or at, at that time we had um, Oracle Streams, which was a disaster, by the way. But you can't quote me on that. But we had a customer mm -hmm. try to implement Oracle Streams and it just wouldn't work. Oh um, my God. I would say if, if you become too nightmare. specialized, yeah, I know, it was. That's why Golden Gate was bought, by the way. You're lucky. <laughs> yes. um, the, uh, if you become too specialized, you become hard to use, so to speak. Mm -hmm. In an IT career, don't go too deep into certain technology. There is a point where I say, and I, I've said this to Fritz many times, we were in the same company, and I said, Fritz, if I need you, I'm mm -hmm. in such deep trouble, I should not have been there in the first place. You know, the art is to never need someone like Fritz. The art is to stay away from stay away from complicated things so you can't get into really deep trouble. If you build an IT system, you should probably understand the concept of all the components. You should understand in broad terms what your, how your system operates. That way, something breaks, you can think of what's wrong, you could probably find what's wrong. If, you, if there are a lot of components you don't understand, or if your system becomes so complicated that you need three or four or five specialists in, in various area, you, you end up in trouble. You know, one of the specialists will leave, someone gets hit by a bus, or someone may turn out not to be a specialist. And how are you going to then fix that problem? Mm -hmm. Maybe something to keep in mind. Don't do things too complicated. And that boss who forced me to choose a specialization, and I never really mm -hmm. chose one. I told him, oh, I'll do high availability. Blah. 
whatever high availability is. And, um, mm. and that's when I started a blog called Simple Oracle DBA. And I think, I think this is one of my main messages actually. Um, mm -hmm. When you build an IT system or a database, you have to be able to explain it to the majority of your colleagues. And some of them, you may think, are not that bright, not that clever, not that quick, or they have other interests. You know, they may, they may want to tinker motorcycles or, or raise cats more than work with a database. You need to be able to explain to them how your system works so that they can run it. And if you can't explain it to reasonably capable colleagues, it's too complicated. If you need to spend too much time training your successor, something's wrong. So your system has to be so simple. It can be understood and fixed and modified and used by the people around you. I used to have a picture of a stack of sandwiches and an IT system is a huge stack of components, hardware, disks, CPUs, memory, cables, protocols, seven OZ layers, what have you. And all of those things, at some point, you have to understand what they do. You have to be able to ask your colleague, what is wrong with your stack? What is wrong with your network? What is, why doesn't your storage work as we think it would? And if, if they can't explain it to you, and if you can't explain to them, you have a problem. So mm -hmm. don't do anything complicated. And then as someone stands up and says, oh, so if you were in charge, we would still be running around in beer skins, right? Yeah. But yeah, there is a, you know, a beer skin you can at least uh, understand and fix and repair. Yeah. You know? yeah. But um, so I'm, I'm not against innovation, but be very careful with complexity. You need to make steps in mm -hmm. your system and, and layers of complexity that you can keep understanding and fixing. Mm -hmm. I should have prepared a speech on this. Yeah. But the one line that is, that was, used to be this. I want to understand what my colleagues do. So I, I need to know what they do. So they didn't need to know what I do. I'd like them to do something simple so I can understand it. So I should also do something simple that I can explain quickly. Does it make sense? Sure, absolutely. Key, keyword is explain. Can you explain it to the next guy? That's probably it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Need to write an article on this at some point. Yeah. Uh, yes. okay. Back to the questions. <laughs> yeah. Yes, oh, excellent, excellent points. I really like that. And uh, the idea to make things simple, it's um, extraordinary. And uh, I understand the point when you talk about innovation, because sometimes innovation can make things complex. So keep it simple. It's a very good mindset yeah. to have, right? Cool. Yep. And uh, with this mindset, you started uh, uh, writing a blog, correct? Yeah. Yep. Yes. And with this blog that uh, make you uh, be, uh, be I, I forgot the, no, the word in English, be uh, knowledge by the other people. It's not knowledge, but uh, people started to know about you because of the blog, right? Uh, partly, I, I always ended my presentations with simple, you know, simple Oracle DBA. So I, that's why I came with the, uh, the blog called Simple Oracle DBA. And at the end of, I think, all my presentations, there is always the, the phrase that if you can't explain it simple, you probably don't understand it. And, and the phrase simplicity shows the master. There's a Dutch, uh, German poet who uh, wrote that, by the way. And I, I like that quote. And, and if you're still into quotes, there was a Dutch professor called Dijkstra. He, he invented the semaphore. So the inventor of the semaphore <laughs> said something like this. Simplicity is essential for an IT system, but complexity sells better. You know, you can ask more money for a complex system. And this is one of the key problems of IT, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Still, yeah. Still, when yeah. we uh, put money in... Uh, are you able to hear me? Is it fine? Okay. When we, no, we the, put every now money, and then the audio is... 
Okay. When we put money on everything, uh, the things start to be like complicated, right? Sometimes people yeah. do it complex just to uh, justify the costs, the price, and so on. That's what you're trying to say, right? Yeah, it does make sense. Yeah. Simplicity is essential, but complexity sells better. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, we have here another uh, question here. Actually, it's a comment from Frank in the chat. He's saying, hey, Pete, tell us some <laughs> stories about uh, the smart <laughs> database concepts. What was that? Tell right. Us. <laughs> I, I, I didn't. No, that's not me. Uh, I didn't invent smart database. I just think it's a good idea. Um, the, the idea for smart database comes from the PL SQL gurus and it was it was rephrased somewhere some 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 six seven years ago by Toon Coppolars. Now he now works for Oracle. Um, smart database is is effectively you do as much work as you can close to the database. Um, it is probably smarter to send some code to the data because you have terabytes of data and your code is about this big. Rather send that code to the database than to pick up all the data and, and bring them to your code. You carry a lot more data to code than you can carry the code to the data. Code is smaller, code is easier. That, that's the first one. The next part is if you if you suck the data into the app, I, I, I tend to take, I should have taken a McDonald's uh, thing, but imagine this huge mm -hmm. McDonald's milkshake. That's your data. Mm -hmm. You have the straw, you suck it up. This is not a nice image. You suck up all the data, you muggle it, and then you have to spit it back to the database. That's not efficient. Mm -hmm. You could much better put the enzymes in the milkshake and process it there. Hmm. Now, a smart database yeah. doesn't do the sucking. A stupid database eats up all the data, tries to hmm. process it, and then whatever stuff results, and I'm not going to call it the S word, then it <laughs> spits that back to a database. Hmm. That's twice the traffic. Everyone is busy carrying that stuff around. That's not efficient. You know, that's not smart. So smart database, you put a stored procedure in the database, you do one call to the stored procedure, stored procedure does all the, all the work, and then you're done. Mm -hmm. I, I need more space for my Italian. <laughs> so smart database is right. a database that does the processing for you. Does it make mm -hmm. sense? Hey, hey, Frank, is that enough? Like, eh. <laughs> Hey Frank, tell I, I us or send, <laughs> right. us, send us more questions. <laughs> cool. Uh, we have we also have here uh, Pete half half Silva say hi all, and Fernando Simon is saying coffee is yeah. waiting, Pete. Yeah. Ah. Oh, uh, tell Fernando I'll be there on Saturday, Friday or Saturday. <laughs> I, I I often stop at Fernando's for coffee. Cool. So, I don't know how Fernando Simo, my friends want coffee, coffee prepared. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, I don't know how many of my friends want this published, but uh, when I travel around through Europe, I can show you a map. I've been on the road now for um, more than three weeks, I think. I mean, I can look up the number of days, but that's a bit complicated. 22 days. So this is my 23rd day on the road. And mm -hmm. I, I think I have coffee once or twice per day with someone somewhere. Not all of them want it on the internet. A lot of them don't want their location known, but I, I have a coffee date for tomorrow and you know who you are and you might be listening. And uh, Fernando, um, Saturday, is that okay? I know it's, a week, it's not a work day, but uh, my trip takes me through Luxembourg on Saturday. So I'll ping you. you know. All right, all right, cool. And yeah, as Frank is saying here, uh, yes, Pete is a speaker who rides across Europe to go to conferences. Mm -hmm. Always nice stories. And one yeah. thing that uh, people that it's watching us don't know is that when we schedule our Golden Talks live, I remember when Pete said, "Hey, let me check where I will be in that uh, that yeah. day." I and I thought, 
oh my god what he is saying and i was not aware that you are a dba a traveler dba and you are traveling for many days to many different places yeah. each week that uh, this is very cool yeah. right and uh, cool and yes <laughs> please please go ahead <laughs> yeah no i i this is this was my hobby i i like to even before i had motorcycles i did like to travel a lot and i think it's mm -hmm. important to go and, and sit down with colleagues and find out mm -hmm. what they think what they know what they want mm -hmm. that sort of thing um that that's the essence doing it on a motorcycle is just beautiful and and i really like to travel around europe and i uh, i keep telling people you know if you if you're in for a coffee let me know but and and i'll probably try to visit yeah. i actually wrote a blog about how to meet up for coffee with a traveling motorcycle dba because some people want to meet up under the eiffel tower to make a nice selfie or, or in front of a, a monument or a, something like Sagrada Familia or the Tower of Pisa. Mm -hmm. And the answer is, no, it's a waste of time because we will both lose time finding the Eiffel Tower, lose time parking our cars and motorcycles, lose time finding a place for coffee. No, no, just, just point me to a coffee or an ice cream or a bakery next to your place of work. We'll meet there and we'll have a chat. That's the important part. I wrote that whole thing down and, and the person who caused it will probably listen to the video at some point in time and say, yeah, 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 I remember. <laughs> cool, yeah. cool. So, and maybe Peter, you, you can do this traveling motorcycle here in Brazil. What do you think about that? You can st start from south and, get, and then go to the north. Visit every oh, don't. city <laughs> and meet everyone. I, I, need more I am in Sao Paulo, need... okay? Just to let you know. <laughs> Oh, it's okay. I, I've survived Rome and I survived Bucharest and, and Warsaw and Paris. I, I think Sao Paulo, I know it's dangerous, but I'll, I'll try. You know, I'll, as long as I have a good motorcycle, I'd like to try. Um, maybe. I, have a, I, I had a daughter who worked in Colombia for a while and I kept threatening, I'll visit you, I'll visit you. It hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. I travel for work. It, it is a business trip. So to speak. it is definitely a business trip. It's a work expense. My motorcycle is a work expense. Um, so I need a good excuse, a conference, a meetup, a project, uh, work, an article, a book, something, something that I can present. Look, I went to Moscow to do this work. And, and yes, I chose to go by motorcycle. Yeah. Makes sense? Oh. Yeah, and uh, one yeah. question that I have about it, your your traveling, uh, you usually go alone or with some else in your motorcycle? With some, um, I travel alone on the motorcycle. Okay. I have spent days traveling with other people and, and that's fine, but for a really long trip and because it's work, remember it's my work, for the, the other mm -hmm. person who travels with you, it is a lot less interesting because I have to get to Bucharest for a meetup, or I have to get to uh, Slovenia for a, a day in and off, and for the, the partner traveling with you, that, that's a lot less interesting. Mm -hmm. So in general, I travel alone on these trips. But I'm, I'm up for like a day of riding. I have a couple of friends in Germany with whom I ride mm -hmm. through their area, and they show me monuments, uh, bridges, museums, whatever they want to show me, and, and uh, uh, the Gurus beer places, uh, mainly yeah. beer gardens. Shuhaskaria, yeah. Shuhaskaria, yeah. <laughs> <Shuhaskaria. laughs> <Shuhaskaria. laughs> I'll never get there. <laughs> you know, the, the nice, good food. Nice. <laughs> yeah, the good food, right. Yeah. With Caipirinha, of course, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, only after the, yeah, this is why I'm currently still on water. I, my beer is in the fridge. Okay, cool. <laughs> and uh, uh, talking about this traveling and also uh, about the conferences, you are a guy that usually go to the conference 
as a speaker. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience with that? How was your first conference? Uh, was you nervous or it was fine? <laughs> yeah, you were nervous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course you're nervous. Um, being nervous for a speaker is healthy. If you're not nervous anymore, you, you become complacent, you make more mistakes. You, it, it's good to be a little nervous. Um, and mm -hmm. what, uh, what uh, this is very much my own opinion. I think a conference should be from people who, who've done their work, who have experience and who want to talk about it. Uh, a lot of people have a lesson to tell you. And I, I tell people and I tell conference organizers, you know, get more real world speakers and, and maybe get a little less vendor sales uh, and new feature speakers. It, it's fine, but the vendor will probably present the new speakers anyway. I'm interested in, in the people who made the mistakes, who've, who've got some experience, who, who can tell me what they've done, not what they want me to do. Um, this is one of my angles. And if you need speakers for a conference, or if you have uh, a shy nerd that you think he, he can he can make a good presentation, you, you need to go back six months in time. What was your biggest problem? What was your biggest challenge? And what did you do to solve it? And there you have a presentation. The, the chances that somebody else can benefit from that experience are fairly high. And that's the kind of speaker I would um, encourage to speak. There is a blog about that, you know, Google it. Right, okay. And also we can uh, get the blog and uh, put in the description here. So if you are seeing this video later, oh, I'll, get you, uh, put in the description. I'll send you, uh, I got that somewhere. <laughs> I got that somewhere. Okay. All right. Your link is coming there in three, two, one second is getting in it's in your whatsapp chat by the way i don't right. it's uh I, I don't have youtube open i'm just seeing your part of the screen actually sure okay we can get this later no words about that uh so uh and uh, one more thing after the conferences after the blog you was nominated uh, as an oracle ace because of your contributions right Correct. The, the ACE program is, is a bit silent at the moment, um, but it was to, to, to nominate, to, to point out people who contributed to the community by presenting, by writing, by um, sharing knowledge, essentially. And I, I got nominated in 2009 uh, more or less by accident. I had an ambitious colleague who was also an ace and he said something like, if I present you to my customer, I want you to be at least an ace. So he forwarded me and, and a couple of weeks later I was, I was ace and I, I discovered the whole world behind it. It was quite, uh, it was interesting. It was a good, it was a good program. Right, cool. And uh, in any way, uh, uh, the conference, the ACE program helped you in your career, uh, maybe to find a new job or have more salary or something like that? Mm. <laughs> there are a few anecdotes about that. When I got mm -hmm. the... Okay, I think our connection uh, part did a break. Oh, we're back. Okay, we, we go again. Okay. I got nominated yes. and the boss of my boss became very friendly suddenly because, oh, we mm -hmm. have someone nominated. He, he arranged for me to be introduced at a company meeting on a stage. And by the time they wanted to have me on stage, I had already left the meeting because I was carpooling with someone and, uh, you know, we thought it would be okay to go home early. The, the ACE program didn't give me a salary raise. And my boss at the time tried to uh, claim a lot of the benefit and the, and the honor. The same boss had never approved travel. The same boss had never 
helped me get to a conference. The same boss had told me, you know, customers are not paying for you to speak at conferences. We cannot charge higher rate because you speak at conference. We need more hours from you. And that boss <laughs> suddenly claimed to the whole world, I have an ace in my company. You know, what kind of boss is that? Mm -hmm. Is that, uh, right. I, I think some of the DBAs will probably recognize that. And an ace title doesn't really give you a salary raise. It gives you a bit of visibility. Think about yeah, that. That's true. Your, most of your and bosses couldn't care less because they can't charge extra and the customer will go, Ace, hmm, what kind of arrogant bastard is that? No. <laughs> so yes, be careful also, with that. <laughs> yeah. And also I usually say that uh, when you become an Ace, you also have a pressure because now you are an Ace, so you must contribute. <laughs> Otherwise, next year you are kicked out, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, uh, that that is uh, yeah. There was a, a discussion it's not, last. It's not the end. It's the... just the beginning, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. There is an, uh, a manager who said something about uh, generating impact. Um, yeah, but most of the aces did not do presentations or write books to have an impact or to. Or, or to do marketing and, and those aces that do personal marketing and branding, uh, they're not my favorite aces. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm a bit skeptic about the, um, the point system and the, the, the marketing dimension of the ace program. Maybe, are you still working? Maybe we need to find a way to, um, to point out people who, share knowledge independent of vendor who share knowledge that is verifiable that is not tainted by some sales and marketing uh, dimension like an ace could get more points and and the points keep you in the program remember if they included cloud topics <laughs> and then when they found out that my cloud was the amazon cloud eh, no more points <laughs> Be careful with that. You know, management will. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe, uh, maybe this is something for you as well, uh, Jilson, to, to think about. You need to find people who are presenting useful, usable, objective knowledge, true knowledge. If you, you know, who, who present their mistakes as well as their benefits rather than to present a shiny new product that will replicate over clusters without ever going down or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The or Oracle is very much a marketing company. So yeah, and the ACE program, don't forget the ACE program gets funded out of marketing, not out of technology. The ACE program mm -hmm. is in essence a marketing effort and I, yeah, maybe we should cut that out of the view. I, I do appreciate being in the program, but I've never, yeah, checked my blog on. I, I've been, I wrote a couple of blogs on, on my thoughts about the ACE program and conferences and DevRels and all. Neutrality, I think, is important. Uh, true experience is important. Um, mm -hmm. And the other, and, and this is another dimension. I would only want people nominated who, who have done in-person presentations. I, I, I want to have to met them. I want to know who they are and how they react to questions. A knowledge transfer is a delicate thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's cool. In any way, any program that uh, help uh, other people with sharing knowledge and information, yeah. in general, it's a good idea, right? Yeah. And uh, yes. let's talk about yeah. let's talk about uh, things that it's going on now, uh, like cloud. What can you share us about your cloud experience, and what do you think? Uh, how this is gonna change uh, the way we work and things like that? Oh, well, I would hope that with cloud, I need to worry less about uh, details and I can work more on concepts. 
I, I like some of the cloud offerings from, from Amazon or Yuga or even Oracle. Um, I, I don't want to spend my time patching my database. And I really don't want an army of people doing the patching for me either. You know, I, I want my cloud service to work and to do a few things and to do them well and to do them reliably. Uh, mm -hmm. Cloud was a really good concept when it started because you could rent, you could, you could hire, rent, create a cloud managed database and it was just there. You connect, you create your tables, you do your thing. It gets backed up. You have a click interface for recovery, easy. You don't worry about patch levels. You don't worry about the next version. You, you basically have a lot less to worry about. That was good. By now, the cloud offerings from Amazon and Azure and, and Oracle, who, who uses Oracle Cloud? Anyone, really? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, not, not really. Yeah, I, somebody raising his hand in the back of my room. Um, yeah. if, if you end up with like uh, 500 services, like Amazon, how are you going to pick the right one? And if you choose an exotic service, who's going to maintain it? Who, who will understand that service uh, well enough to, to use it with you? you know? So we have to be careful. If you use a cloud that you don't create additional complexity again, you, know, you can use a cloud if, if you can simplify stuff, if you can outsource rely, reliably to Amazon. Amazon runs a great RDS, but if you start using too many of their offerings, it becomes complicated again. And cloud-wise, I, I hate to promote a product, but um, I have two really happy customers on Amazon. They use Oracle on Amazon, and they mm -hmm. really, me and them, we don't worry about versions, we don't worry about patching. We, there is a lot that we don't have to worry about. You know, database upgrades, database upgrade assistant, and, and 17 uh, the service requests open. Never. We press, we press a button. That's it. And it's like a I, I like that level of cloud service. You know, and I, mm -hmm. I've told one of the Oracle managers, um, why don't you stop trying to push your cloud? Why don't you focus on a really good database? You have a brilliant database. And look at Amazon, their delivery is so much smooth, so much more professional. You know, stop trying to push your cloud product to the few customers that you can catch and concentrate on building a really reliable database and let Amazon do the delivery. And then find two more Amazons, partner with Microsoft or partner with Google. Let those companies do the delivery. Oracle, your delivery sucks. And Oracle, most young developers don't want to work with Oracle, don't want to hear the name Oracle. All they know is Oracle is hate. Oracle is license. Oracle is lawyers. Oracle is bad news. So take a step back, get in the background, focus on a good database. But uh, maybe we should cut this out because they're going, never going to buy me beer again. <laughs> <laughs> but Oracle is a brilliant database, right. yeah. but it's an awful it's, it's just an awful company if you are on the wrong end of a licensing salesperson. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's a, that's a why really people run away. Interesting point of view. Yeah. Yeah. That's why people run away. Yeah. Sure, sure, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And uh, talking about the new professionals, yeah, as yeah. you were saying <laughs> about the new professional. Uh, what is the tip is that uh, you would like to share uh, with them, the ones that he started his career in this Ooh. brand new world with cloud and so many technologies? Yeah. Who? Mm. I, uh, who am I to tell them what to do? Um, but uh, one thing that I, I've taken away from the beginning as well, I was lucky with my bosses. And, and if you have a boss that you cannot trust, or if your boss doesn't trust you or, or abuses you, you have to dig a tunnel. You have to get out of there. Um, I know there's a few people who are either listening or will look at the video who, who don't have a good relationship with their boss. 
and, and who are considering to move. Um, there are good arguments to stay in a job. If you like the job, the situation, the money, the, the whole situation, fine. Mm -hmm. But you really have to find a boss you can trust. I've, I've had this when I worked for a large company. I have been able to change bosses. If I didn't really like my boss, I, I just found another manager. I literally walked to another building to find a better manager. Um, but that's important when you start and, and, and when any place you are, you need to be able to, to trust the people around you and your boss most of all. That's one. The other technology, mm -hmm. I'm a data animal. So I would say focus on data more than on program because data lives longer. You know, data mm -hmm. is forever. And a program will probably disappear within three years or so. There's a, a Python is hot, or Python was hot two years ago. I, I'm now doing a little bit of Python, which means that Python is already no longer hot, and you should be doing something like Go or uh, Kotlin or what what have you these days. I I don't care, but Python does a good job for me, so fine with that. Um, data mm -hmm. lives longer than code. That's another one. And, and then again, you know, if you like to tinker with code, if that is your passion, uh, try mm -hmm. to do that. Because if it is your passion, you're probably better at it than when, when you try to become a data animal, but you don't really like working with data. If I tell you data is hot, data is important, data lives longer, you know, if you don't like data, then, then maybe don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who am I? I, I'm, I'm not ideal to give young people advice. Mm -hmm. Probably better advice would be make sure you work in the same room or the same team with some some grey bearded, you know, sandal wearing. You know, <laughs> if if an old <laughs> colleague has Birkenstock sandals under the desk, that's a good sign. <laughs> or <laughs> because find, that means he's really old. Uh, yeah. Find a colleague that uh, have a lot of beer to pay to you. This is yes. a good idea. Yes. Yeah. Find find a but, colleague uh, that has sandals under the desk. Yeah. 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 <laughs> cool. uh, and uh, I I like uh, the 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 mention that you said about uh, data animal. I really like that, and I take note of this the the two uh, of the uh, two tips that you added to us. I I really find them amazing. Data it's forever right right yeah. and program uh, usually we can say about the history uh, one time get obsolete and old so data never uh, get yeah. old and uh have a boss that you trust i really like these two things i take note yeah. here and you have this in mind every life every golden talks live i usually got some things that i usually use it to <laughs> myself and i like this yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Really like you. Yeah, really tips, nice tips, thoughts. Tips. Thank you for that. Yeah. That's uh, the nada. Mm -hmm. nada. But, but the tips. Nada, yeah. Obrigado. I, Obrigado. Yeah, the nada. I, I remember nada. that expression. <laughs> <laughs> um, if if tip, tips for young people, uh, I don't know, have a chat with some old gray beard, but then there are a lot of old people that I wouldn't really trust for tips, myself included. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Really I, nice. I, maybe, maybe here's one. Here's one. When we were Oracle, we were the young animals, the, the, young, the, the young dogs. The mainframe people did things mm -hmm. differently. And it was hard for them to accept that. Okay, we have some connection break. Let's see if you're gonna go back yeah. soon. Yeah. Yeah, we are back now. Oh, we're back. So for the mainframe people, it was difficult to accept that Oracle was the next database because they could do things so much better and more efficient and faster and JCL and reliable. Um, and now we think Oracle is the best possible JCL. database. It's really clever. Program it. Yeah, J job control language, yeah, an old IBM thing quite reliable stuff, solid mm -hmm. stuff. And, and PL SQL now is what we think is solid. 
uh, RDB MSs, MS SQL or, and Oracle and Postgres, we think they're reliable and good databases, but th there will always be a new generation coming. You can't stop that. Now, what I don't like is that new systems are no longer acid. They don't store things reliably. They uh, they are eventual, consistent. That That's probably not good. You need to keep some of that knowledge like asset, mm -hmm. like a, a transactional commit is a commit period. Um, you need to keep some of that knowledge, maybe read code and date. What, what is asset? What is third normal forms? And what are the 13 rules starting with zero? And uh, if, if you keep that knowledge, you're probably ready for the next generation of data processing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I'll stop now. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's cool. That's cool. And uh, one more thing, talking about this uh, experience and uh, and things to share. Uh, one thing that I I think we didn't talk. When you do your travels, there is there is one thing that I would like you to share with us, and you mentioned it to me, and that is learn about the locals on travels. So, is there any cool or funny thing that you learn about the locals when you are traveling? that you yeah like a lot <laughs> but like <laughs> like in some countries if you order a starter that's a meal for two people <laughs> and in other countries you order a starter and you get really hungry after eating it um mm -hmm. but uh locals and travel every country is different and has its own habits and rules and if you put a frenchman in 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 germany he will behave, if he behaves like a French person, uh, the Germans won't like that. And, and on the other hand, if, if a German goes to Italy, he will go nuts because the traffic is chaotic and you have to, to get the pulse of every country and, and sort of adjust if you can. Now, that's the, uh, and that's the one thing, you would, I think when you learn that from traveling, but you learn that if you travel by plane as well. If you do travel, get out of the Hilton, you know, get out of your business hotel and eat local, mm -hmm. that, that, that sort of thing, and, and mix with the locals. And I, I think, again, I was lucky. I was always lucky. When, when I did a lot of my business travel in the late 90s, I had to train uh, people in various countries. So we, we went into a country. Our boss would send us for four full weeks. So we had three weekends in each country. Yay, a weekend. And cool. then you, you get to know a bit of the pulse. And the locals would mm -hmm. take you out to their eating places. You know, how do they eat? What do they drink? Uh, what is their habit? We were sitting in a call center, so we heard a lot of the local knowledge on the phone, how, how to take an order. After two weeks in a call center, in just about any language, you could take the order. You know exactly what to say and, uh, and you learn the numbers. But um, right. it, it is a way of finding out how the, the locals operate. And one of the stories was when the, the French system had a problem. Uh, they called our central team and, um, mm. and and they asked for me. It wasn't quite my mm. area of problem. And, and, and the team at that point, I think, was seven people. And they, they asked me, can, 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 Pete, do you want to stay on the phone? Do you want to be the intermediate? Because you seem to understand more of how we operate. And that's probably because of, I had made a big effort to go to lunch with them, to, to sit with to sit down with them to to have respect for the way they wanted to work although my order my orders were to make them work exactly according to our system but you you can only do that by uh, gently listening and interacting with them you know mm -hmm. it helps and if you are an englishman of truth and this is what we do we are going to work with this system we don't have to work with your people but your people will work with our system. You know, as in, <laughs> you work with the system or we don't work with you. <laughs> ah, another nice one was a, a report by oh. a, an American company in Europe. 
and they needed three custom reports, very expensive reports to make. And, uh, and the manager goes like, uh, so this, this report is going to cost me like so many hours. So who needs those reports? And uh, I was, uh, let's say a guy called, uh, I think it was uh, Paul needs the reports. Little guy, black hair, uh, pale skin, very small guy in finance. I think it was Paul. And uh, he was he was a bit of a pain in the ass. And so this American manager says, okay, so if I fire Paul, I don't need those reports. Okay, problem solved. Paul will get reassigned. And Paul disappeared out of the enterprise within weeks. Uh, this is, you can work <laughs> like that, but, but you don't get the respect of the locals if you work like that. Yeah, Let me put it that way. Yeah. Okay. He did solve true. the problem very, though. <laughs> <laughs> you're right and very clever your um, let's say position when you are traveling and uh, having the locals near to you understand how they do things yeah. and uh, this uh, also it's uh, good for you because I would say that uh, when you are uh, uh, people a person that the, the other ones the local ones like you they will try to help you in every situation and when you are in another yeah. country another place i would say that uh, sometimes we are maybe lost and not aware how to do things right and locals can yeah, help you true but it's, there are probably also a few locals in the world that, that don't like me a lot okay <laughs> <laughs> I, sometimes really i, I had to imagine tell people no <laughs> I, I, I have I've been the bringer of bad news as well sometimes, yeah, but um, no, it, it helps if you can connect. Another thing about the video things and the COVID, even before COVID, uh, and again, I was lucky. In my era, in the late 90s, the tel you could not uh, remote work in, in, in from Brussels to Curitiba or from Brussels to, to Auckland, New Zealand, because the latency was too bad and nowadays hmm. remote work is is better possible and that means we have less people interaction that means people are on video calls and i had a, a big a lot of dinners on my trip and one of the people in vienna was martin berger who said when when they kicked us out of the restaurant and they flipped out the lights and martin said oh we've missed this this was a good dinner and we could not have had this discussion over video. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, there are things you need to do in person and you build a different trust on when, when you are kicked out of a restaurant because they closed the shop. Um, it, it's different from when you have a video call with someone in Malaysia, you try to explain why the backup doesn't work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's different. I have this mm -hmm. the same thing. I've I've worked with one of the bosses in Malaysia when I who serviced both Philips and Shell. I, I can say those customers mm -hmm. now, and they work with the same provider. So the second provider that when I was with Shell, I said, "Look, maybe you need to talk to a guy called Alvin about this." And I think he's your boss. And they goes, "How you know Alvin? You know Alvin?" I said, "Yeah." <laughs> Tell Alvin mm -hmm. I sent you and and ask him this question. And uh, Elvin came back and solved the problem. Uh, because at my time at Philips, I was in Malaysia. I had looked up Elvin and we had had dinners together. I knew this guy was important. He was in a key position in the provider. I needed to talk to him. And, and I was lucky again. My Philips boss was okay with that. Elvin was okay with that. He was boss level. Um, and because we had that personal contact a few times, we both benefited for years. Just mm -hmm. saying. Cool. Alvin, if you're listening. That's very cool. And this, uh, uh, this approach, né, as we are saying, this clever approach helped you in this way. That's very nice. And uh, talking about now uh, drinking, uh, what... Uh, what type of drink do you like to drink? <laughs> just oh, water? Uh, just uh, si no simple beer from tap. You know, a, a good fresh cold beer. And I'm not a beer snob. I'm not on untapped, and I I'm not going to comment on a beer thing. 
four. Oh, this one's a bit less hoppy than the previous one with six. No, I'll just have beer, fresh beer, cold beer, light beer, lots of it. Okay, cool. And what yeah. about the Brazilian caipirinha? Yes. <laughs> Did you like with, it when uh, you came which, to here? Yes, with sugar from Reed. Yeah, with the true sugar. Yes. I know, and yeah. I like it, and I'll drink it. Yeah. And it, it is yes, similar. We had uh, the Polish user group. We had a vodka evening. And of course, mm -hmm. you have to be careful because it's fairly strong stuff. But um, mm -hmm. I like that as well. And I was in Croatia a few days ago, and they presented me with a bottle of the local rakia drink made from plums. Mm -hmm. And they promised me I would only drink it with friends and I would send them a picture. That's what it is. So I'm, I'm, okay. I can drink a lot. I can drink different things. I, I have to be careful not to get drunk. But um, <laughs> I, I can appreciate most local drinks. Mm -hmm. Who's the, who's so that when, in the you, other image? <laughs> when you come to Brazil the next time, I can uh, show to you some very nice drinks too, if you wanna, of course. Okay. And is it, uh, there is, is a... the best caipirinha of Brazil. There is a place that you have the best caipirinha here in Brazil. I will okay. show to you. <laughs> I'd be interested. Okay. If you uh, if you visit the Netherlands. Our local drink, apart from the Heineken export beer, uh, our local drink is distilled from wheat, from grain, mm -hmm. and is extremely smooth. And I can have you taste that if you like. But it comes in very small glasses, and you have to drink it slowly and appreciate it. Mm -hmm. well, well, that I, is I'm our thing. It, it, seems, <laughs> it seems good. <laughs> okay. All yeah. right, all right. And uh, what about music? What kind of music do you like, Pete? I have a very simple taste in food. Um, and my, um, I had an Australian boss and he, he only liked, he, he didn't like foreign food. I, think he, I don't think he would be listening, so hi there. Uh, and we were in Japan and, and Thailand with this guy together. And he would just go to TGIFs or uh, some uh, O'Reilly's or so, something Irish or something American or something Australian, maybe. Uh, what, what do they call them? Steakhouses. Um, and in Japan, Andrew, we're in Japan. Sushi, teppanyaki, let, let's try something local. They have pictures on, on the menu, so you can just point out, I want that, let's try it. And he said, no, 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 no. I'm not risking my stomach. No, he won't. So mm -hmm. after that, so a couple of those experiences in Brussels, his statement was, yeah, but Pete will eat anything. You know? And mm -hmm. uh, I'm proud of that because when I go to Malaysia, I want to try the chap choy and, and the local stuff. When I go to Brazil, I want to try the uh, churrascarias. Churrascaria. Churrascarias, thank you. <laughs> okay, when, when I go, yeah, when I go to the U.S., I want to have breakfast at Danny's. You know, when I go to Thailand, mm -hmm. I, I want to eat Thai food. The extra, well, be careful with the spicy stuff, but I can appreciate mm -hmm. that. You know, um, go to Morocco. I want to eat the couscous with, with the lamb and stuff. Mm -hmm. I want to eat the local food. You go to the Balkan. You want to try the kebab. Yeah, whatever. When you're gonna go to Poland, you you probably want to try the um, the pierogi or the zeppelini, mm -hmm. and nobody's ever heard of them, but Google it, and and it, it's <laughs> it's good. You know, it, it's local, and if you are open to that, you taste it, you can enjoy it. You eat the local food, drink the local drink, yeah. cool. and when I get back to Holland, I'll get my spare it. Yeah. yeah, what a class about yeah. how to eat in each country. Really nice, Pete. <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, we have also here uh, on the chat Leonardo. He say hi there, Pete. From your experience, if you could pick the most important trait of successful DBAs, which would be? Good one. Hang on, go, okay. go back a little. You 
Go back. You sure. said what a class. Uh, yes, I said what to... a what a class that you gave to us. Say what to each in each country. It was really nice that, and then. I started to read a question on the chat from Leonardo. He asked, uh, he said, uh, hi there. And then Pete, from your experience, if you could pick the most important traits of successful DBAs, which would be? Oh, well, you need to be able to quickly absorb technical knowledge. And, and, con and concepts, um, DBA. Um, if, you, if you're into infrastructure, you need to know a little bit about operating systems and storage, and you need to be able to, to, to use VI or Emacs to edit your files. That's all, all of that is important. But the, the most important part, even, even for a DBA, is to find out what your developers and, and users need and and see if you can align with that see if you can provide that but this is my opinion okay i i prefer to go and, and interact with the developers rather than to hide in my in my operating system um, but i know it's important that the operating system is working mm -hmm. there is no uh, what is the important treat for a dba yeah Jim Kuprinsky can talk for hours about that. Um, but you need to be communicative. You need to be technically curious. Um, you need a, a, a bit of base, you need a fair basic understanding of data modeling, the like ACID, 13 rules, date and cut. Um, and a DBA, Nowadays, you, you have to realize that there is another generation of databases coming. We've had mainframe, hierarchical, we've, we've, we have relational, we, had, we now have all sorts of uh, object stores. And we, we, you need, and I, I don't have the good answer, but you need to find out what the, the positives of each of those technologies were and, and carry that on to the next. And I, I, in my opinion, Mongo and Cassandra are making a lot of mistakes. Mm. But if you know those mistakes, or if you know that technology very well, you can probably build reasonably reliable systems with them. Yeah. yeah. So what? Mm. What is a good? I don't. The honest answer is I don't know. You will find out. If you are going to try and become a DBA, you will find out, you know, and you will find out in your situation. No. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we got a good, good question. I, uh, I can't read the answer. Yeah, he, I... <laughs> yeah. he said a great answer and thank you. That's cool. And, and uh, if we would summarize it, it was something like focus on technical things and concepts and uh, also have a boss that uh, you trust. <laughs> Yes, right, yeah. <laughs> actually, the, the, the concept is probably uh, an interesting one. I miss, with, with things like Elasticsearch and, and Mongo, I miss the concept guide. Oracle used to have a concept guide. I think that the best thing I ever did was read that concept guide because I, I got a very, a much better understanding of my database by reading that concept guide. And I've already talked to Frank about this. Frank, someone needs to write the concept guide for Yugabyte. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's cool. That's cool. All right. And uh, going back uh, on travels things, I have one question about food. What is the kind of food do you like? As you are oh, a guy that spare knows ribs. the best food in <laughs> I, I'm meat. a simple guy. <laughs> <laughs> when in doubt, you know, find, find a place with good spare ribs. But, but right. also in Asia, you know, find a good sushi. Mm -hmm. uh, or in, 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 in uh, a country with, with no uh, pork, um, find a good uh, kebab. <laughs> mm -hmm. the, the, who does the, the clip part? Because I like that. Yeah, you like yeah. it. Yes, we have here a, a streaming director that is playing all these 
uh, cool stuffs in the background while you are speaking here. <laughs> yeah. And now I think he's brick uh, connection. So let's wait if he he's gonna go back. Yeah, we are back, Pete. Yeah, are you hearing you? Okay. I will say yeah. that the the one who is doing all of this cool stuff while we are talking here, it's a uh, uh, director streaming. He while we are speaking, he is playing with these uh, gifs and so on, make our live uh, nice and cool, right? Okay, it works. Yeah. To a point. Yeah. Do we have? Uh, <laughs> All right. Do we? Do we have what? So, so if I come to Brazil, what would you recommend me for food next time? Mm -hmm. What is your? Uh, what is your mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, See how difficult this is. <laughs> yeah, I can. Yeah, you put me in, in a in a in a. We change the. <laughs> The place, right? You asking me now? Okay, I have a, uh, an answer for that. Uh, there is a food that it's really Brazilian, yes, and it's like with rice and beans, with some meat and uh, sometimes cheese. Uh, I don't know if people are listening to me here in Brazil know that, but we call here like Bayão de Dois. I will show to you some pictures, but it's a really typical Brazilian food that uh, I like very much. And I think it's very different for you. Maybe you like instead of barbecue, which is very nice. Yeah. There are a lot of others, but the one that uh, I would say is a typical one from Brazilians, at least from my, uh, uh, how can I say that? From the place that I came, because you know, Brazil yeah. we have a uh, different place and different uh, cultures. Even if it's only one country, we have the different cultures in here. So I can show it to you later. Maybe you're gonna like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for the Europeans and the others listening, Brazil mm -hmm. as a country is bigger than Europe as a continent. So it is no wonder there are three or four or five different good foods yeah. in Brazil. Sure, sure. Yeah. If you go to the south, of course, the uh, people from there would say, it would suggest other things. For instance, in Frank, it's from the south. So he might suggest another type of food. I am from the, uh, from Sao Paulo, yeah. but uh, my family, yes, it's from the north. So my yeah. typical food, it's from the north of Brazil. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and, and that would be cool. that would explain the rice. Yeah. The, yeah. Yes. Also, That's when it. in Curitiba they told me the music in the north is is better. People sing and make better music in in like uh, Recife. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not. I would not say maybe it's better, but. Uh, Sometimes, most of the time, it is. But the difference is that people from the north of Brazil usually like to dance, and the music yeah. you are gonna listen. And even if you don't wanna, you are start to do some, right? You're gonna dance. <laughs> Just listen to the music. Do you know that kind of music? That even if you don't yeah. wanna dance, you're gonna dance listening it. Yeah. So this is the type of music that you're gonna find there. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm curious. I need time. So need. come to Brazil the next time, and I oh, show yeah. to you good things. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Be be careful right. because what people say that to me sometimes I show up on their doorstep. <laughs> can, can I but can like I the, tell the, you one the, thing mm -hmm. that uh, a few people might maybe don't know that it's watching us? I work in, here in Brazil for almost two years uh, in a project with Indian guys. So in almost two years, um, each two or three months, different Indians came from India to Brazil. And uh, somehow I started to be like the guide, the Brazilian guide. Yeah. And uh, when they came, they, when they came to Brazil, the first thing they asked is, who is Gilson? I would want to meet him because uh, I started to show them the places to Someone of them came to my home, and we gone. We, we went to some restaurants and things like that. Uh, I did two travels to Rio, Rio de Janeiro, because they yeah. wanted to know there. And I said, okay, this weekend I'm fine. We can go together. 
and uh, I traveled to Rio de Janeiro to show the the place, the Sugarloaf, the Christ Redeemer, yeah. and so on. It was really nice. So I, we can think about this to you. Ipanema, yeah. Yeah, and I think the connection break a little bit. Ah, we are back again. No, okay, fine. Peter, very nice talk to you. And as I mentioned, uh, we are almost one hour and a half. Remember that I told you it seems too much, but but when you are talking, one hour and a half just yeah. run fast. Yeah. And there is one more question that I always ask to everyone that uh, comes to golden talks and the question is what it's success to pitch the visitor oh i remember you even prepared me for this one yeah um well i told you that uh, 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 this, this is yeah. okay they skip the next part success is that my kids are doing well that's important <laughs> I'm, i'm really proud of my daughters uh, success is also that i can i can actually choose to to sit on a motorcycle and 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 ride around europe and visit friends and still work that that is a lucky mm -hmm. thing as well um and and success mm -hmm. is also to have enough people in europe where i can come for a coffee a meal or even stay the night i have friends around the continent and and some of them are italian and are totally chaotic and and others are german mm -hmm. and are very strict you have to show up at 1500 exactly because we will have coffee from 15 to 1530 thank you sure. <laughs> you know <Long> <laughs> and, and that's fine and i have friends in france who insist on having a wine with the lunch because you know this is uh, france yeah we have wine mm -hmm. with the lunch yeah Mm -hmm. I don't drink when I'm on a motorcycle. Um, I, I'm lucky to have those friends as well. And I met them, some of, most of them via work, by the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, yeah. so, so success is having all of that. My kids, my job, uh, the, 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 the choice. I can, I can sort of choose what I do. I think that is, that is an important success factor. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm... Um, Yeah, I, I really miss the uh, the conference in person meeting. Everyone who went to poke, and I'm, no. but uh, that's probably success. Being able to do what you like, and it's nothing to do with money. I, I'm not very rich, by the way. I spent my, my money on my motorcycle. I like that, and uh, we can yeah. see that uh, you know very well each country, each culture, each people. I like that, really. <laughs> <laughs> Don't laugh. And if you yeah, no, if no. you come to Brazil, you also have one more friend that uh, I can show you some good place too. Uh, I know that you came uh, to Curitiba, Rio de Janeiro, Flor Florianópolis, but uh, São Paulo. You didn't came to São Paulo yet, right? Did you really want to hear my São Paulo story? <laughs> yeah. Yes, the, uh, of course. Remember, we we sat we sat in the call center only if there is time. In nine, I think it was ninety eight. We were in that call center, mm -hmm. and I was doing my course and trying to convince the locals to, to work the way we want. And then there was a tax ride, a tax race. And every every customer wanted to place an order before the tax raised. And my desk phone rang. Now normally my desk phone would be a colleague, a boss, someone who had the number. I picked up the phone and it was a Portuguese woman, girl. And I mm -hmm. said, oh, I'm sorry, you must have the wrong number. And she said, no, she says, my name is uh, such and so, and I need to place an urgent order. And I dialed another number because all the numbers are busy. So she had just dialed mm -hmm. the next number in, in the order. Like if 28 was the ordering number, she dialed 29 and tried 30 and 31 mm -hmm. and ended up in my desk. So I wrote down the name, the numbers and the data. And I had already listened to that process. So I, I knew more or less exactly what the phrases were and what, what the answers would have to be. I wrote it all down and then she said that now you need to bring this to Otavio. 
So, okay, I'll bring it to Otavio. And, and the people in the order center went like, oh, thank you. It was a really big order. <laughs> and uh, years later, they said, they said something like, uh, she was the daughter of one of the important customers. And they said, oh, and by the guy who took the order. <laughs> that was good achievement for me. <laughs> All right. Oh, you we took had, that we had, order. I, I took that order. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> You know, I would say that a, uh, a very short part of the story just break because of the connection. You were saying that uh, uh, the girl was uh, a daughter of some important customer and then, right? Oh, and she really wanted to place the order. So she had just mm -hmm. dialed a few random numbers in the office, like the next number in the list. 21, mm -hmm. 22, 23, and 24 was my desk number. I picked up, I managed to understand, oh, this is a big order. Let me write it down. I put the order she was to talking the manager. Portuguese or in English? Uh, both, yeah, both. Oh, English, okay. enough English for me to understand. And I could answer in Portuguese because I had heard the phrases from the call center enough to know, ah, oh, you mean. Obrigado, de uh, nada. Obri, that sort of thing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh seis metros, yeah, seis metros. And uh, seis so metros. I, I brought the, yeah. I wrote it down, yeah, seis metros, I brought it down, brought the order to the manager, and I said, oh, yes, thank you. You know, that is the daughter of our most important customer. Said, oh, okay, nice to know. <laughs> and a couple of years later, people say, oh, you know, she still remembers you. And we still know you took that order. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was in the middle of a, a, a tax race and, and everybody was panicking to get orders in, orders in, orders in. And apparently this was the one important order that had gotten through somehow. So my little story about Kurichiba. Right. And, and it, was nice. from, uh, it was from it uh, was from Sao, Sao Paulo. Paulo. It was uh, Sao Paulo. Yeah, it was, it was to, to Sao Paulo, say it? Yes, Sao Paulo. Say that again. It was Sao from Sao Paulo. Paulo. Sao Paulo. Yes. Yes. Sao Paulo, yeah. 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 Yes. Right. If you, if you right. maybe don't remember this later as uh, Churrascaria, you can watch the video again and check it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Thanks. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, so we are uh, coming to the end of our talk, Pete. Yeah. I would like to thank you very much uh, to you, uh, pick up a piece of your time to share knowledge and information to us. I really appreciate that. Uh, we, if we, uh, people that is watching us don't know, we did a preparation before. So we also uh, use it. Uh, we spend some time to prepare, to talk, and to see the talks. And now we are here doing the Golden Talks live. So there was a time that uh, we uh, spend to this, to have this nice talk, to laugh as we are doing here during all the Golden Talks live. So thank you very much, yeah. Peach. To uh, to I forgot the word. Thank you very much to uh, share with us all of this knowledge and information. I like it very much to have you here on the Golden Talks. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Yeah. Obrigado. De nada. De nada. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. right. I like it. <laughs> the stories I take notes. Yeah, I take notes about many things here. Thanks for that. And uh, uh, we're going to end uh, the Golden Talks now as we always do, usually in Portuguese. Let's see if I'll be able to do it in English. So, okay. So, uh, if you like this video, uh, don't forget to give your like and subscribe in your channel. And uh, the most important thing is uh, replicate knowledge and share this video. See you on the next uh, Golden Talks. Bye-bye, people.